Game loaded. Hi, and welcome to another edition of the Lessons Learned podcast with myself, Lessons Learned, and Chapelmon. If you're joining us from last week or just joining us now, uh, this uh, version of the podcast, we'll be going to be talking about a very heady subject, uh, heated, I suppose, as well, and that's going to be um, diversity in gaming, part two. Now, we sort of talked about the subject a lot last week. You can check it on the VOD here on Lessons Learned 1, the Twitch channel, and, of course, in the VOD on YouTube, also under Lessons Learned. Uh, and with me tonight is my co-host, Chapelmon. Hello. <laughs> and this time around, we're going to even go even deeper because we're going to try to figure out how you do diversity, not simply why you should do it. Um because it's very easy to talk like we need more diverse characters from all backgrounds, uh, you know, people who are handicapped, people with different uh, d distinct or different uh, people who live in the spectrum of uh, a gender and sexuality and age and ethnicity and race and what have you. Uh, but actually doing it is can be very tricky. Now, mm. we ended the program with by saying, you know, just do it. You're going to make mistakes, but just go ahead and do it. But that is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this. So we're just going to be rapid firing uh, a lot of ideas out here and based partly on our experience and things we've seen and played. And if you, a chat, have any ideas or comment, you can join us in here on the live uh, program. Or, of course, you can drop uh, comments, polite ones, as are always welcome, on the YouTube channel. So let us begin. Um, I think there's three areas that we talked about last week, and I think it's it's good to to repeat them and put them in an organized manner, is that three situations. You have erasure, in which an ethnic group or, or gender or what have you is completely ignored, right? They just don't exist yeah. in this universe. Like, whatever universe or world you're building for your video game, they apparently don't exist, very common in fantasy, Western um, fantasy, for example, the sort of historical excuse, even though, of course, not North Africa is just across across the pond from Western Europe, you know, and there being trade links and and political links with North African nations for, I don't know, three, four, five thousand years. So, you know, there's that. There is, I suppose, stereotypes, which is everybody wants to avoid for the most part. They tend to be negative. Um, then you have tokenism, when is oh yes we we too we have we have, we have that one character who happens to be whatever. And then finally you have well two things you have part of the background a character that is more or less fully implemented but is not the main character, and then you have main characters that are driving the story or the center of the story, which fall outside whatever norm we think it's, well, the norm. So let's concentrate on those last three, I suppose. First of all, how do you avoid tokenism? Ooh, tokenism. <laughs> so essentially, all right, so that's harder to to avoid than anything. Open your face. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now I'm getting fed. <laughs> oh, it's good. Excuse me. That's fine. Um. So avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so it's in essence the the good uh, as i think we mentioned this uh, last week is that you start um, you don't write specific characters you write characters first then kind of tack on to them but that kind of you're either going to end up with a with a character that's of a certain background but doesn't reflect that accurately or maybe at all mm -hmm. or you're going to end up with a you're going to end up um, the other side of the pendulum is where you have a really good character, but then you kind of tack on all the uh, essential background to make them fit this uh, specific uh, diversity quota. Mm -hmm. So ha um, having a diversity quota, I think it's 
probably the first problem, right? Because thinking in terms of percentages. And I've seen a lot of people who criticize the lack of diversity in things. They're like, oh, but, you know, there's, I mean, one thing is to point out that there's too few minorities. That is why they are minorities, because we have too few of them. But approaching a work with the idea of I have to have a certain percentage or number of X, Y, or C is, I think, the first step in the road to tokenism, as opposed to writing a character and saying, okay, as I write the character, oh, this character happens to be have these qualities, and I'm not going to be afraid of putting those qualities forward if they present themselves. Exactly. One of the biggest examples I can think of is um, Will Smith in um, Independence Day. His character wasn't specifically written for him or was written as a black person, uh, but it obviously works well with Will Smith. It, he and in essence he's not a uh he's not a token character in that he just happens to be a, a character who got, just happens to be black yeah i mean he made the role his own right um yeah and shows a, a reality of the united states military is that the nazi military has been des desegregated for decades and it the percentages of people that tend to join the nazi military in different capacities kind of mirror the, the actual numbers of people in the United States, especially because it's a volunteer occupation. Aside from perhaps wealth, that's the one thing that, you know, people who have more money have less tendency to join the military because they have less need of it as a career. But in e oh. every other class, uh, across class, when I see numbers, uh, African-Americans, Latinos, Muslims, Catholic, you know, Christians of different denominations, uh, and now, of course, with the changing policy, well, the, there was a recent announcement of another changing policy. We're not going to get into that right now. Um, uh, gays, lesbians, and, and other members of the LGBT community have also joined the military. Or, more to the point, they have been acknowledged they've always been there. Because before there was no, you know, um, don't ask, don't tell. In other words, we sort of know you're there, but as long as we can pretend that you're not there, there's yeah. no problem. Which it goes back to the idea of erasure, right? It's like, oh, as long as we don't know, that's fine by us. But the moment we know, it's like, oops, you're in trouble. It's like, why? Just because you did. Okay, I mean. <laughs> you know? No, which kind of makes me wonder if I, I'm not a fan of any of these, uh, of these military shooter games, but it makes me wonder why. I don't think I've ever seen a one of these, you know, the cover character on one of these military military shooters be anyone but uh anyone of a caucasian background well again i think it goes back to something that we talked about the last time a normalization right we have an expectation that the hero is going to look more like captain america than say black panther Right. Black Panther is the exception <laughs> captain america is a rule right your supermans your batmans your tony starks in superhero comics, uh, you know, your Rambos, your, uh, you know, the, if the story's always been about the white character, then you go with the white character because that's what you know about. It's like, again, going back to our the dead horse of Mass Effect, the main character is uh, presumed to be white, and the dog didn't approve, uh, <laughs> white male Canadian, as an exception. And heterosexual, and straight, and, heterosexual. And, straight, and straight up till the third game. <laughs> up to the third game, right? So, and in fact, many characters are assumed to be heterosexual unless specifically told otherwise, which is, I think, part of the problem as well. Uh, part I think of tokenism is like we're deliberately trying to break the norm, and I think maybe the approach should be that there is no norm, hmm. right? That these norms are just something that we're enforcing, as opposed to saying, oh, "Well, I don't." There's no norm. Ergo, if this character comes in and is other than what you expect, the problem is not on us, it's on you because you're being surprised about this, especially if you don't approve, right? Yeah. And then you come up with excuses like historical excuses or this is the way the military is like, dude, I mean, let's look at the reality or, as opposed to what you expect. Or like, uh, I think probably one of the most famous uh, things in gaming would be if you... Um, beating metroid the original metroid it's like oh the scientist is a woman Ooh, 
I didn't expect that because women can't run around and shoot aliens, I guess. Well, again, the expectation was to be this is a guy. But the thing about the original Metro people don't know, uh, and I, I guess I have to thank Anita Sarkeesian for pointing this out because I didn't have the NES when the Metroid came out. Uh, when, the Metroid, yes, the Metroid. Um, <laughs> is that if, the better you do in the game, the less clothing she wears when she takes the armor off. It's just, you know, like She'll take the helmet off and she'll, she has long, long blonde hair. It's like, oh, it's female. And then she'll take like the, the top of the armor and eventually she'll be in her bikini if you do extremely well in the game for some reason. So it went from, <laughs> oh, my, you know, Samus is a girl to, oh, she's a hot space fighting chick in a bikini for 8-bit graphics on the NES, of course. <laughs> but it's like, well, yeah. if you were aiming for that... I guess you you went right past it like this. Yeah, Oof. yeah that, I didn't know that. <laughs> and he, I even heard, I've heard reports that in fact, Samus is supposed to be a trans character, trans woman. Mm. I don't know how accurate the report. I don't have a, a link to it, so I, I I don't I don't dare to say certify that. It's like, oh, that's the truth. Yeah, that's, <laughs> gotta be careful. Yeah, with that. that that's the first I've heard of that. Yeah. So, but I I heard some people, you know, some rumor somewhere on the internet. And I'll leave it at that. I think one of the content on the creators, I think. So tokenism, I suppose the best way to fight it is by not giving in to the idea of the norm. In other words, token is supposed to show variety and sort of challenge a little bit the norm. But it it kind of fails, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it's one of those uh there's a line there's a very fine line to it and it's really hard to see mm. until you have the, the character on page or on screen is like aha it's like yeah that was a, the phrase about obscenity i don't know what obscen uh, what is obscene until i see it. i suppose that used to be no no i can't tell you what obscenity is but i know it when i see it that's the line mm. and i think it's very similar in this situation um the second part, of course, we're talking about um, goes a little bit beyond tokenism. It's sort of making the character the special character, and the special character of the of the episode, especially if it's a sort of side character. Oh yeah, yeah. The character has more the going on to them, but it's like, oh, this is a very special character in this very special episode or game that shows. Yeah, that the the we, special guest character. Yeah. Um, not always done badly, but I think it's sort of become its own cliche in a way that the only way you can accept this character there is like it's a sort of temporary and to the side, which is not, not bad having in characters in the background. I mean, again, diversity shows different colors, etc. But if you only limit that, again, your opportunity to that and... and you sideline them all the time. <laughs> exactly. Uh it's sort of like, oh, you're allowed to exist. Look how benevolent we are that we're allowing you to exist, right? We're giving you space to be a character. And I think also the part of the problem is it, and this is something I said many times before when it comes to diversity and, and creating characters, like there's a difference between a defining characteristic and defined by a characteristic. Which is, again, a very thin line, but very important. It's like, if you are, de if I say defining, I mean it's, you know, devastating gender and ethnicity, race, etc. are one of many characteristics that form the character. It looks like a real human being, right? We're, we're, we're a multiplicity of things because experiences of our lives are, are complex, you know? We are what we experience from our parents, the place we're born, the language we learn, the media we're... Eh, you know, exposed to the social groups we share, the time and place we're born and grow up and whatever age we are at any one moment. Um, and I think that should be a reflection of the character, right? You can't ignore that one thing that, you know, we want to see because we don't want these people to be erased. But at the same time, you can't make it all about that as well. I mean, you can. Yeah, you can. 
<laughs> but it shouldn't it shouldn't be the new norm that every time say a gay character comes it's like wow man it's so hard to be gay yeah I can't, oh my I can't. god my my parent my parents kicked me out when they found out yeah i was homeless my, at 12 and i had to my, go to prostitution and like dude oh, oh okay i i get it and or for example a famous character who spent half a game crying reminding us that he was married to a man it's like in a, <laughs> in a universe yeah. where that's not supposed to be a thing when Nobody should care because it's not illegal. Nobody's, you know, discriminating against it. It's like, yeah. Oh my god, I hated. I so much hated those two care. I hated Trainer and Steve as as a gay person. I hated those two characters. I can see right through them. It's a, it's the first thing with uh, Samantha Trainer. The first thing was, uh, hi, my name is Samantha Trainer. I'm your new communication specialist. I'm a lesbian. She might as well have just come out and said it. Yeah, I, was like, <laughs> I mean i mean it was it was some it was one of those like they try to be subtle but they hit you over the head with how subtle it is Ooh, oh my god edie you have such a oh feminine sexy voice <laughs> and then of course you got the opposite just steve's like oh my god my my husband <clears throat> oh i miss him he died oh i was happily married to a man <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations! The, uh, yeah, the, sorry I missed like, the wedding. I would have brought I don't know quiche or something. I, I the, yeah, you get you get those characters that they they have other attributes to them, but the it, it's so bizarre that they make that their one defining feature. I mean, with well, with Steve, they they did some bizarre thing where uh, they made his skin darker so i'm not entirely sure if they try to make him a little more ethnic mm. or maybe a little more darker because i would assume from his last name cortez he might be spanish because uh, if you notice all his scenes mm. all of all of his scenes that are not in dlc um he's it seems like it's way too dark and his and he looks like he's in the dark all the mm. time that's because he was supposed to be originally a lighter character from what i read mm. But look at Samantha. She looks like she's supposed to be Indian, but it, I don't think at, at at any point does that come out. Like it's that's never explored. I think it's a joke about that uh, in uh, Citadel DLC, where she talks about curry. It's like, oh, I hate oh, curry. Yeah, yeah. Which is I, that's, that's a sort of an oh, yeah. ethnic joke. I think she, thing. That's yeah, it. I think she mentions that. Uh, yeah, you're right. I think she does mention that. That she's like, oh yeah, why? Why do you think I would like curry? I think she talked. She, but, she, she's, it's too strong her stomach. Stomach, so it just messes it up. Which is, you know, I said the same things about. I don't like beans. I'm a Puerto Rican and I hate beans. So I, <laughs> I said the same thing. That's the kind of joke. Is like you know, breaking stereotype a little bit. It's like, don't expect me to be your stereotypical uh, Hindi or Hindu woman whatever that yeah, means. Every, yeah yeah all my uh, all my friends are always in disbelief that i don't really like very spicy food yeah i mean yeah. i've gotten i've gotten used to it but i i hate like oh like food that'll make me feel like my my tongue's on fire mm-hmm. like why am i expected to like that food <laughs> yeah but those i think it's uh, important uh, yet yeah, dorian from dragon age inquisition yeah i i was gonna bring him up next because he he's sort of this kind of special case to where he falls into that tokenism of oh you know my fan i came out and my family rejected me trope but i think the the reason why it works it's because you see it in this completely new environment we've never seen this particular story told in like the dragon age universe like how would this look like yeah and in a culture that that isn't very much explored to venture like mm. what what is their culture we don't really know much about them in prior games you just know oh they used to kind of rule the world they're kind of evil in quotation marks because they use blood magic they like using magic a lot they kind of believe in the chantry but they don't actually follow the official chantry so you do have i think um with Dorian, you you fall into that trope of, uh, yeah, you know, my my family rejected me or my father specifically rejected me when I came out. 
But then he tried to change me using blood magic. Like, okay, that kind of adds a new level to it. Yeah, conversion therapy, magical style, fantasy style. Yeah. Like that's what it is, which is it's a real issue in real life, of course. Yeah, um, but I think I think that's sort of, in that case, I, I think it kind of works a little better. It, it kind of changes enough to it to make it not as a, as much of a a trope i guess well i think or- the reason is setting you you, you hit it on a setting in mass effect it's a, it's the sort of sci-fi idea of we're so far into the future that the old sexual or gender conventions no longer work we sort of outgrown those old superstitions even yeah. in settings like star trek where they rarely talk about that or kind of kind of you know, especially in the 80s and 90s, they were like, yeah, we can only go so far with this, right? Unless they make the, the character uh, a villain. <laughs> uh, I'm looking at you, Kira Uh Not your fault, the actress, but the you know, writers. Um, and, uh, but, I mean, compare that, for example, Babylon 5. I remember uh, which I seen a podcast. I'm a big fan of the show. And there's one scene where these two characters have to go on the cover. And they said, well, we got you tickets to go to Mars. Uh, and they're two male characters, both of them heterosexual. And they said, oh, we got you your tickets, but you have to travel as a, as a married couple. The thing about that, and I remember seeing it when I went back to watching it, uh, on thanks to YouTube, <coughs> is that they don't bat an eye. <coughs> they're like, oh, oh, my God, I'm going to be. Mary, oh, I gotta pretend to be with this guy. And we're no, it's like, yeah, that's just, just, that's just the way it is. Okay, people are married and we don't care. They started making married jokes, but the kind of married jokes that wouldn't be out of place if the couple were heterosexual. Hmm. In other words, it's about pretending to be married, not about, uh, same guy. Oh, well, you have a yeah. penis and I have a penis, and oh, uh, that's so bad. <laughs> uh, you know, no. And they make all the whole jokes, and he's, you know, one character's just goofing the other. It's like, well, when I get to meet your parents, and, you know, you didn't, we got married, you know, we eloped, and I didn't meet your mother, and what she's going to think about me, and uh, all kind of those kind of jokes that would have been fine if the, the well, but fine, well, they, they're pretty funny, the characters make it work. Um, Regardless of the gender of the characters, right? Which makes a statement that, in, again, in the future, gay marriage is legal. Uh, no, same-sex marriage is legal. And people don't give a shit. They just don't, <laughs> you know. And I think that it depends on the setting, right? But Mass Effect has, is supposed to be that way. But the way presented kind of breaks is like, well, if that's supposed to be this way, then why are we focusing so much on the fact that this character had a husband and reminding me that a husband and we're in Dragon Age Inquisition. And, and they, I think they do a, a fairly good job of it because it's supposed to be pseudo Western medieval fantasy. The fact that Dorian comes from a high class for nobility. And especially because of the magic. So I double down on that. Inheritance. Bloodlines having children was very important to the medieval mind. And yes, there's also the, the sort of, you know, both legal and religious aspects in, in real life and real history. But the fact of the matter is that the, the, the discussion is really about, and this is what Dorian says, you worried only about your, and I'm quoting the game, your fucking bloodline, right? Mm-hmm. You would have me pretend and do whatever in private, but it had to be private. I have to be in the closet because you needed children. So you wanted me to have sex with someone that I didn't care about, have a loveless marriage like you had because he saw his parents didn't care for each other because of the necessity of social pressure to have children. There's also, a, a, if you read some of the background material in the South, it's not supposed to be that much, but there is one example of... I think one of the lords in Ferelden built a castle for his son because his son was gay, and so basically it's like, okay, you can, you can have a you can have a wife here in the official castle, right? Have children, and then go away and do whatever you want over there. <laughs> you know, went to the trouble actually building an entire castle. I think it's the villa in the in the first um, in the first uh, in the wilderness in the first area that you're in. Uh, as in, you know, as long as you perform your duty. You know, social duty, having children, we're not going to care, right? And that, I think there's a realistic decision based on, on the history, right? 
and the setting that justifies that, right? A little bit. Well, you know, you, if, you, if you push too much, it's going to break, of course, but it's more there. I think setting provides context, and I think it's one of the things we tend to forget is, like, characters don't exist in a vacuum. They're a representation of the setting and a reflection of it. And I think that's why I think I find Dorian. Also, I like Dorian. Dorian's an adorable character. I like I Dorian, too. I like him, he's, too. Yeah, so he's charming, adorable, and I was like, dude, you're like my best buddy ever. You know, come on. Let's kill some people. <laughs> and the fact that you find me hot just pumps my ego. Just, just <laughs> saying, you know, I, I don't feel the same way, but God damn it, it feels good to be a gangster. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, and then, of course... But those are side characters, and, and unless you choose in one of those games to pursue a, a same-sex uh, relationship, like a available character, your main character is, is presumed to be heterosexual. So how do you make a game where the main character is either, and we're going to use that word again, allowed, or... It starts from the get-go saying, you know, let's not presume that anything. And um, that it isn't, by the way, a dating sim like uh, the Hot Daddies games that came out, which, <laughs> of course, I mean, that's the goal, right? How do, you how do you mainstream that? How do you, you know, normalize a main character who is not part of the norm as we like to see it, you know, or we are used to or being fed, fed to? Yeah, that's, I think, the real challenge. Getting used to so, the idea that your main character, the player character, can express themselves. Yeah. Or more so, to the point, independent of the wishes of the of the of the of the of the of the, um, of the player, perhaps, which is you know, it brings its own dimension as well. Yeah. So. I think in going back to uh, Laura and uh, Tanya's uh, talk on um, on this subject, I think Tanya had a, had a, expressed it best when she mentioned that we probably need more more uh, writers uh, for games in um, with different backgrounds. So essentially, we kind of need more diverse <laughs> diverse people in gaming. Mm -hmm. But and uh, you know that's why she also brought up the fact that you know you probably you might need if you can't get writers you probably need a uh, people to consult consultants mm. um i think a game that kind of reflects this uh, best is uh, a little game i played back a couple of years ago called uh papo and yo which uh is i think by, i heard uh, about it yeah but uh minority I, they call themselves minority studios or something mm -hmm. um but in that game i kind of noticed like small things you 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 play as a kid and you play as a i think he's a brazilian because mm -hmm. and the whole game i think is also done in brazilian and portuguese, i even portuguese. write <laughs> portuguese or yeah, yeah. <laughs> and brazilians I, are going like yeah, we love our language but come on yeah <laughs> sorry <laughs> brazilian or uh, portuguese <laughs> yes i i always have a thing with uh, when i hear uh Portuguese because it's it messes with my uh, Spanish because I pick mm -hmm. up on words and I feel I'm like I should understand this but I, I don't mm -hmm. it's like why can't I understand this language it sounds sort of familiar mm -hmm. uh, but uh, something I really enjoyed with that is I, I recognized uh, the environments it's even though it's set in sort of like this uh, dream environment it's clearly based on um, on what the character's uh, real life uh, environment is so I recognize a lot of the shanties, the shanty towns. Favelas, yeah. And, and, uh, and obviously the the character is also of color, mm -hmm. and uh, it deals with heavy themes of uh, of uh, domestic violence and child abuse, and it has seen it has themes like that. But I I I kind of like that when we move away from um, our traditional Western environments like that and that's something i don't quite understand when well i guess i do kind of understand with a smaller independent place uh 
studios why do they always feel the need to set their games in like say america or maybe in it's some place that i guess more western audience would uh relate to yeah as if like that that's the only place we could relate to mm. uh donut like donuts uh most uh, famous game life is strange is set in america despite the fact that they're a french company uh pseudo america because it's it's a yeah. <laughs> private school that uses yellow school buses and yeah I don't uh, know. it will yeah then um well granted their first game was set in like a futuristic uh paris mm. and had a character of color uh, like a half a person with a mixed heritage. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, that, that game didn't do well for many reasons. But I, the game I really enjoyed, rem, uh, remember me. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think of a uh, big studios like a uh, Qu um, Quadratic Dreams. Uh, Heavy Rain is set in America, and I believe they're the studio is not American at all. No, like, I think the uh, the outer is either <laughs> French or, or, Bel or Belgian. Uh, uh, <laughs> David Cage. Monsieur Cage, yeah. <laughs> Monsieur Cage. Although uh, Mr. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the thinking that Heavy Rain, I think Mr. Cage would do better not making games. Not that he shouldn't be bad at what he's doing, just that just abandon the idea that he actually is making games. He's making something else which is weird and wonderful and horrible in his own way. It's, it's, it's an acquired taste. Yeah, but but I, just bless you. Just keep doing whatever it is that you're doing, and we'll see what happens. And and of course, our newest game being set in um, Detroit, uh, mm -hmm. becoming humans. Another one with and robots that are the two main robots are also white. Yeah, despite the fact that they're androids and they could fit in, maybe it says something about <laughs> about our culture that we have to make our robots white too. Yeah. Also, but, Detroit. I don't know if anybody's being. I suppose that's another thing. It's like it also reminds me of Deus Ex: uh, Human Revolution, which did have a lot of characters of different backgrounds, but the mainstay characters were very much white, uh, especially set in Detroit. As if people never actually been to Detroit, and the fact that there was white flight, and I suppose if you, I mean, there's a lot of white folks in Detroit as well, because. Yeah, it's a, mo but mostly if you uh, if you've been to Detroit and it's still kind of the reality of it, it's said past what's called Eight Mile, and you heard about the both the album and the movie. Uh, it's a, a, re a reason it's, it's it's cyclical, and and so you have these roads that are you know they have first mile, second mile, past Eight Mile, you start getting into the suburbs of Detroit, and the suburbs of Detroit are very heavily ethnic. Like there's Mexican town, there's I think it's uh, Arab town. It used to be Pole Town, but most of Pole Town got paved over for making a, a I think it was a Ford factory. Uh, and then of course out side of that, then you have your real white satellite suburbs that are extremely rich. Mm. People who actually go if you if you see Detroit, you see in the middle of Detroit, there's basically these cluster of of very beautiful buildings. They're the big three, right? Your Ford, your et cetera. And then there's Detroit and the Detroit that got more dilapidated and, and, and run down. What happens is that the people who live or work outside of Detroit, mostly white folks, they go bypass all of that right into the highway, right into the work, go into the offices, maybe the factories, and then they go out, right? They go in again to watch, you know, uh, the sports games, mostly the basketball maybe it's the baseball and the Tigers and they go out again, right? This very, Detroit got uh, abandoned essentially by white folks starting in, 19, in the 1940s really and then 1950s and 60s and 70s. So when people talk about Detroit and all that, that's, that's something they're not really telling you with that. So then all of a sudden there's a future and all these white folks are so come back <laughs> back to uh, Detroit where they would say Human Revolution or this new game. But you never, I, I suppose we never really talk about gentrification. You never, there's, I mean, there's, a, there's mixed people. I mean, there's, you know, they, they'll say it's human religion kind of showed that they were, although most of the gangsters originally were black gangsters and the police was sure. white, which can be seen both as discrimination, but also a, um, a, perhaps a comment on power structures, but the game doesn't really yeah. go into that. So 
you know. And, like, and okay. of course, uh, I I remember the biggest uh, controversy with that game was uh, one NPC character of a of like a homeless poor lady who's digging out of the trash, and the people commented that her accent like. I, I don't I don't quite understand. I, they said it was racist, but I'm like, it it is it racist because the, her accent's accurate to what she would sound like? Someone of color in Detroit and just happens to be poor. Is it racist? Like, is it <laughs> is it racist to depict people accurately? Like, I've seen I've seen people of color with with similar accents that are just also happen to be homeless. Yeah, but that's the thing. Again, we talked about it last time. It's like if the only thing or the the majority view of it is, you know, that that's our only colored character. Exactly. Because they take the 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 head of the the corporation that he works for. Oh, I want to go back to Detroit because he basically feels like he. he, 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 he it, I think it's. Hinted that he grew up in Detroit, uh, and he's a baseball fan. Well, I guess he's a Tigers fan. So it's like, oh, you know, I want to bring back industry and jobs to, to Detroit. But it, I think it would have been better if he actually would have been a person of color, right? Not even necessarily a black person. It could have been, you know, somebody who grew up in Mexican town, somebody who grew up in Pol Um And I, I make an exception for Pol Polish people in the sense that they're East European, and most of the things that we like to think about color, especially United States, are based on Western European stereotypes. So they kind of fall outside of that. There's a history of that as well. Uh, or Arab American. I think, well, his name, I suppose, Sar Sarif. Sarif. Hints that maybe he's uh, uh, Arab American, but again, we just get captain of industry, I suppose, right? Yeah, because so, I, I think, I think uh, Adam's pilot's also supposed to be a person of color, though. She, she's supposed to be, I think, of... Middle Eastern, perhaps, or even North African descent, a person of color. Um, pretty cool character. I love her very much. Very sassy. Uh, very, which is a, will also be a stereotype. But again, when you see most of the criminals, although we see some white guys there as well, you know, some guys are just there. I guess they're thrown in for, for good measure. I mean, bad guys can be everywhere, everybody. Uh, but when you see them there, I mean, that's the thing. It's, it goes to setting, it goes to plot. If you're trying to highlight... If you if you want to go quote unquote realistic, you have to sort of go full hog, I suppose, and show why things are that way and why is it that the police department is mostly dominated by white police officers versus most people on the street, whether criminal or not, or people working in factories, or whatever, or not. But the game doesn't go to the to those lengths. Therefore, the only thing we get is the the most of the black gangsters and the black lady, you know picking up a trash and living up the street right so it's like yeah and and the the first uh i guess uh combat uh conversation is with a hispanic person in the background and mm -hmm. you you can choose to if you manage to talk him down he comes back and he just becomes a generic grunt later <laughs> yeah that, that was bizarre i was like oh i thought i talked this out he's gonna be an important guy and then all of a sudden he just shows up and you, you gotta kill him or something i was like Dude, but I, or just I, knock I, him out. <laughs> yeah, do you, I thought you were going to be important to the plot. Oh, it's very interesting. He's supposed to be a, a, a veteran of foreign wars, and he came back and he had to remove his prosthetic because of the cost. So, Deus Ex Human Revolution tries, but like kind I, <laughs> I like the game. I love the game. I play it multiple times, but it, it kind of tries. But the thing about Cyberpunk and all that is that it, it, it's some hit. You know, very the aesthetic is easy. The things behind cyberpunk are hard. You know, it's it's yeah. political. It's the punk in cyberpunk is pretty heavy and pretty heady if you really go into it, right? Uh, so again, it's all about context, right? Yeah, I mean, I think the Chinese parts were fine, but that might go into again my background and my for lack of better terms, my ignorance on like, well, is, uh, is this Chinese culture accurate? I mean, I, I remember seeing like the, the hotels were like, uh, those weird pods. Essentially you're, you don't rent out a room. You rent out this cubby where you just sleep in. I'm like, no. that's a little odd, but apparently that's a thing. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. There, there's some places they're not as common. I mean, they, they, they were sort of a fad, in the late 80s, 90s, especially in Japan. 
and that sort of caught the imagination of a lot of writers, right? And it sort of became extrapolated. It's like, oh, you know, this is how poor people are going to live in the future. They're going to literally live in a in a corner and you know stack beds and stuff like that. And this is it has a little TV and all that. And they, they some of them still exist, but then even in Japan, where where space is a premium, they never become the thing, right? They're not <laughs> the thing. Uh, so I think a lot of that is extrapolation. Um, again, and in one interesting thing, again, I think a power structure is that if you go to uh, in, in 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 China and this uh, forgot the name of the city, sorry, I uh, apologize. Um, the private security personnel, bell tower, are supposed to be British. Hmm. They're mixed. They have different people, in life, but they're supposed to be British, right? Which is kind of a, another another missed yeah. opportunity yeah, to I highlight the fact the whole thing about Hong Kong and the British and the Western powers and China and, and, and colonialism. <laughs> colonialism. And, but then you have the bad uh, spoilers for this part of the Hell Sex Human Revolution. The boss or bad guy for that section ends up being a dragon lady. Like literally, she's a dragon lady. It's like word words to keep out, and she's, uh, you know, and she's trying and her abilities to sort of mess with your mind and and play the victim. And it's like, uh, yeah, a captain of industry mm. whose only real weapon, aside of having a lot of money, is trying to seduce or confuse the main male character, Western oh, male I'm character. Ju- oh, I, I'm I'm just a helpless woman. I'm just a pawn. Yeah. So there's that as well. Um, although the brothel, the brothel you first come in, it's also mixed. I mean, there's many, mainly Chinese women, but there are other nationalities. I guess there's a lot of missed opportunities. And then as a, that was a criticism also uh, levied against Mankind Divided. That they tried to use, and in the first game also had that problem, they tried to use uh, cybernetics who has it and who doesn't as a substitute. And this, this is something that sci-fi does, and even fantasy in a way. Uh, so fantastic racism, right? Oh, yeah. you're somebody who uses a mechanical arm. So that's the equivalent of segregation, right? Yeah, or, and um, uh, or like the circle in uh, Dragon Age. Yeah, and that, or the elves. I think elves. The are, elves, uh, there yeah. you go. Uh, which can work. Yeah, I, I was actually going to bring this up now. I was actually going to lead into this. It's like, so what about when games sort of try to tackle those issues, but take like try to go very indirect, which is, I think, f- for me, like, it's good that you're bringing up the issues, but then you're kind of playing it safe. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, did my camera freeze? Did yeah, it show? is frozen. <laughs> it's, uh, no, it's still frozen in my screen. Uh, it looks frozen on my screen. Yeah. Oh, anyways, so you think like I I think I brought this game up again, and I I finished it this week. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm playing an, an adult game where there's these eight mo- eight men running around, and and I'm not entirely sure if it's intentional. It might be, but these uh, eight men seem to be there. There's certain. Um, there's certain stereotypes going along with them and i think they're supposed to be uh there's certain racism towards them too and it sort of seems like it's uh hitting on the uh topic of racism towards black people but i'm not entirely sure if that's in (laughs) if that's intentional or if it's unintentional and even if it is i'm not entirely sure if this game's it, given the game's attitudes, it's it tends to be more comedic than and than serious. Mm-hmm. Even for and for an adult pornographic game, it's it's very comical. Uh, so I'm not sure if it's 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 it doesn't really usually try to subvert racial stereotypes. It plays it plays them up and kind of makes fun of them. Mm-hmm. But in this one, it it seems kind of subtle and it's just kind of there. It hasn't been mentioned, so I'm not entirely sure those parallels. If it's trying to say something, kind of, but at the same time, it's not coming out and saying it. It's well, just trying to substitute like, one for the other. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you think that's a good thing, or 
Well, a note about subtlety, and I'm just repeating what I said earlier. I think I said it off camera, and we can say it on camera again. Um, just like obscenity, it's very difficult to define a, a, a subtlety, but I know when I see it. And particularly in video games, video games are, they don't do subtle. And I think the reason why video games find it very hard to do subtle, if they do ever do at all, is, is signal posting, right? Being able to deliver timely information to the player so that the player can act upon it means that if you're quote unquote too subtle, then the player is going always going to miss it. They have a chance to miss it. And if it's crucial information or information they just want the player to be aware of, then, you know, that's it. But on the other hand, I think, again, we talked about this last week, the fear of offense leads, I think, to the substitution, right? It's like, oh, we're not going to read. We're going to talk about the subject but not the objects. It's, it's at the thing. It's like removes the object from the subject. And that's really where a lot of the n real life nuance exists that when you do that in, uh, in any form of media, especially in video games, you kind of, you kind of lose it. Cause like, yeah, you're talking about these real life subjects, but with people that don't, you know, without addressing why those things are there. Right. And, um, we just had Chapel on re, um, yeah, I'm, re, I'm re, trying reboost to... the camera. And there we are, I think. The little dark. Okay, oh, yeah, you're coming in. Yeah. So there's that. Um, and I think that's that's also an issue across media, but certainly in video games. Now, the other question is, and we're, we're coming out to the last quarter of the program, what happens to player agency in these situations? Particularly when we talk about, because we said that the, I said the last thing was making the main character other than whatever the norm we expect the norm to be. But, and we talked about last week about, of course, you know, designing characters using, you know, changing facial features and color of the skin and all that in, in the part of the design character uh, stage in RPGs like Skyrim, Mass Effect, you know, many other games. But at some point, I suppose that when you make any decision about the character, you pre-establish a point about the character, essentially you're taking away agency from the player. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to depend on what kind of game and what kind of story you're, you're actually trying to tell. Mm -hmm. So a character that kind of stands out in, in my mind right now is uh, Lee from the um, Telltale's The Walking Dead. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to me, and I never batted an eye to Lee being of a, a being African American, like. And if you look at his uh, background, he grew up. Uh, his parents own a pharmacy. His brother happens to be a doctor or a pharmacist that works at the at the family pharmacy. He's he's a professor. Um, he got convicted for murdering a, a state senator who uh, his wife was sleeping with, and <laughs> that's why he's in jail. But to me, like he, he's a person of color, and he, to me, like that's kind of not something you usually see with a um, person of that color of color with that background. Mm -hmm. He's educated. He, he comes from a good family. Uh, obviously, they have they have their own family business. And to me, like that that was never such a that was never kind of drew any attention to me. Like, oh, he's black, and he comes from a. a pretty good family and and if anything the only time they ever mentioned anything about him being black is one of the southern characters kind of uh kind of expects him to know how to lock pick because he just happens to be black and th that's when he kind of like oh oh hell no you're you're not just you're not saying what i think you're saying it, it's something that's play for laughs but yeah and it also fits the other characters like me he might be a little ignorant yeah well but, i think but, yeah, I think there's a distinction between games where you already have a pre-established character, right? Yeah. Like Lee, right? Uh, and we talk, you know, talk about other games, for example. And those games that are designed, supposedly, with character, quote-unquote, creation in mind. Because there, I think, you really see the heteronormative thing that the, when you open the splash screen, first of all, when you start Mass Effect, going back to Mass Effect, Commander yeah. Shepard, white, male. You can choose to make a female Shepard, femme Shepard, 
which also happens to be white, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can continue to modify from there. Yeah. You play Dragon Age, uh, all the versions of Dragon Age. Again, the default starts with male and white. And then it's like, oh, these are the variations. In many ways, that, although that may not be the intention, the the, the reflection, is... the fact that you that's your opening gambit as a sort of like the default, literally, basically sends the message, at least to me, ironically, for many people, might consider it to be too subtle. And it might be completely something that the designers miss completely, that everything other than the default is by definition a variation and even a deviation. Yeah. And again, bringing up uh, something Laura mentioned is that she photoshopped uh, she photoshopped the character creator for a Mass Effect, and all she did was a uh, flip the uh, male and female to where female would be default over male. And apparently, uh, she got such a backlash for that. You know, so again, I we brought this up. It's like, why are you trying to make us play something other than a straight white male? <laughs> Which is funny because uh, again we I think we touched it last time, the the common defense, and with many games is like oh well you can you can turn your character black right I mean there's that's the option, but the question is why is it that the stand why is it that we choose certain ways to be standard versus optional, and how can we make the optional standard, or should I say? expand the standard so that you don't think of anything other than this very narrow standard. It's like all the things, all that you see is optional. So I think you can always start off with um, optional characters or um, randomized characters. Just mm -hmm. have a, uh, oh, here, bam, here's your randomized character. Did you want to create your own or did you mm -hmm. not even have like a default looking shepherd? Yeah, Saints Row, which which, I, which uh, Saints Row, which I really like because it had like different voices and stuff like that. So you could you could mix and match. You can have like a white character with a Russian accent, or or a Latina character with a Russian accent, or something like that, which is cool. And the games really don't don't take them so seriously. Either, no, but they most focus on the on the voice, and they, they go, okay, if you choose this particular voice, then this is how we're going to treat your character. But it's not treated based on the look because you can make all the you know mix and match and size yeah. and weight and whatnot um although i always made a very busty female <laughs> character because you know I'm a oh yeah that, that i'm a pearl uh, but um <laughs> sorry chat um yeah um talk about diversity um but the thing about it is again when you you fire up that screen bam that's what you get um, and I think I think that's, that's something that Laura and 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 I forgot who the person Tanya. was. Here. Tanya, thank you very much. We're talking about. They never really touched that. Although I, Laura did write an article about it, and I will put it on the notes on the YouTube channel uh, about how you can tell your you know the the story that the design the the the, um, the choices in game design tell. And I haven't read the entire article. I will read it in full, and hopefully I can. Probably she touching some of these subjects, so we're just repeating her words. Um, but again, the the choice to to default to a known standard, I think it's much it's it's much easier to accept the fact that oh, this is a character and I can't change anything about it. I don't start with the the opening gambit is I don't I have agency over how the character looks and certain aspects of the behavior because it's already there. Either I play the game as is, or I don't. But once you start giving people a choice, even a character creation, you have those arguments, which really boil down to who gets to set the standard, right? Who gets to be in control, right? And quote-unquote being forced to play something else. Yeah. And, so... and breaking through that... Um, uh, I think that probably is the one thing that um, because again we talk about games like um, I think one, well, well you know they might be a solution because going back to something we said last week about the Elder Scroll games just to speak on Bioware all the time otherwise that's a very similar thing they have stories 
if you think about the setting stuff like that, they strongly hint. They give you other options, other races, like not only humans, but also like cat people and stuff like that, where it strongly suggested that you should, the story really should make more sense if you play like, say, Skyrim, a Nord, or uh, if you play Oblivion as an Imperial, because that's where you're set, or if you play um, Morrowind as a Dark Elf, right? Maybe that's a way to do it, right? You can strongly suggest through setting and background, even plot, certain options as preferred and vary those. You know, not simply talk about characters, also talk about setting, talk about uh, plot and why these things would be different uh, and where you set the game so that you get proper context of the characters and say, oh, you can, you know, if you want to play a, a Lily White Nord, you know, son of, you know, uh, fantasy vikings and go ahead you can do that but this is this is the land this is a desert land and the people here are you know they're red guards and they're dark skin because you know melanin and you know sunburn and you know just kind of makes sense you know and go from there right if i think if if the next game that they, they're probably working on the um, after they make sure that every toaster in the land can run skyrim they'll probably make a new <laughs> elder scrolls um suggesting say a uh, place like you know, I don't forget the land of where the red guards come. But if they say red guards, I probably play a red guard because the setting suggests that that should be the character you know I should play. And yeah, if I want to play like, some, I play something else. Then fine, but you know that's that's uh, that's it. You know, or like uh, some of the other non-humanoid characters, like the elsewhere where where the cat people come from, or the Khajiit. The Khajiit. The, the Khajiit, oh, or the marsh for the, uh, and and I want to call them Angoras. Those are those are Mass Effect <laughs> characters. Yeah, no, no. The the lizard people. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can you can do that, and you go from there, right? Or the orcs, the orcs seen them, right? They have their own. Well, they used to have a land, and they got kicked out of that. And but you can make a story around orcs. You know, I, I love the orcs in Sky and in, in the Elder Scrolls because. They're the orcs that are honor, but they're they actually show a lot about a variety. They, they sort of play with the stereotype of the orc, right? Like you have honorable orcs, and you have working orcs, and you have thieving orcs, and you know. So, if you could apply that to other types of, of games, I think that we're good. Well, folks, mm -hmm. we're coming close to an hour. We started a little bit late. I apologize for that. Next week, I think is going to be the last part of this rambling discussion about diversity and this one is going to be pretty interesting i think because it's going to be about the need of the audience because we talk about we talked about a little bit in the first uh, um episode uh, part of this uh part one uh, but this is going to go to why people mod and why people do fanfic <laughs> why is it that in the face of the things that we're we're, we're seeing people are like no no I'm going to mod so that this character does this or this relationship happens. I'm going to write fan fiction uh, in forms and stuff like that that has these pairs and stuff like that. <laughs> or, or in my case, make a, a fan video using uh, the in-game <laughs> in game cutscenes of uh, making a gay uh, Garrus and Shepard relationship. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because, and this is this comes from the heterosexual guy in the room, White House, I, I want to know, because clearly, not only do we want to be, all of us, in, in different ways, we want to be represented in our scheme and play people like us, we want specific content. And this goes not only to diversity, but also goes into the idea of ownership. Who really owns the product, specifically a video game? So we are not done with this subject yet. It's no, we're talking a very complicated subject. Uh, and as always, if you have any comment, of course, you can always drop in the chat or during the live chat and also go to the, the bot on, on Twitch and on YouTube under the title of Lessons Learned. Um, and I'd like to thank Chapelman, who was always a fellow YouTuber, for always being here on Friday. Uh, almost never made it. Well, that was me. Um, this Friday, but we, we squeezed in uh, in spite of the, the, the problems with the camera and everything else. So I also thank you for that. And... Uh, <laughs> yeah. And as always, if you like this or any video or live feed on my channels, please comment and subscribe, and I'll, we will see you when we see you. Good night. Good night, everyone. <laughs>